Hello, and welcome to Next Quest Podcast, where I ask your potential therapist questions so you don't have to. I am your host, Noah Garcia, licensed professional counselor supervisor, and today on the show I welcome Jen Matthews Popovich, licensed professional counselor supervisor and owner of Hiatus Wellness, to talk about her practice and specialty, schema and narrative therapy. Today, I welcome to the show Jen Matthews Popovich, licensed professional counselor supervisor and owner of Hiatus Wellness, who will be discussing her practice and specialty, schema and narrative therapy. Welcome to the show, Jen. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. So, um, what are your credentials and experience? You're an LPC supervisor, so you have supervisees. Um, where did you do your supervised experience? So I am originally from Alabama and I moved here by way of Georgia. So that's a little bit of an answer. Um, I finished my bachelor's and master's in Alabama at Troy State University. Um, so I did my internships there, of course, in my master's program. And then I immediately moved the very next day after I graduated to Savannah, Georgia, which is where I got all of my supervision. I got fully licensed there. And then shortly after getting fully licensed there, I moved to Austin and transferred my license here. Cool. What kind of uh, environment did you do your um, internship in? Um, like the wild west of mental health. So <laughs> um, I don't know if this still is this way now, but when I first moved there, you know, you're fresh out of school with a master's, you're going to change the world, right? and uh, I couldn't find a job. It was 2008, if you can you know, remember what was happening then, and it was December of 2008, so we were pretty in the middle of like people losing their homes and their jobs, and uh, you know, I said, let's move, uh, and so <laughs> I took the first thing I could get, which was in a day treatment program for the chronically and pervasively mentally ill. I did, I did that for a little thing. while. So um, it wasn't a master's level job either. I just found, you know, um, what was available. I am practical if nothing else. And uh, so I knew that I couldn't just sit around and wait for the perfect thing. And then about a year after that, um, a new psychiatric hospital for adults opened. So in Savannah, it's, it's very different than Austin, even though Savannah is a fairly large city. Uh, there's only there was at that time only the state mental health hospital. There were no private hospitals in the whole city. And so one opened and I started working there. Still within a year of graduating and they put me on a 25 bed psychiatric unit as the only therapist. And I didn't even have a license. <laughs> and that's where the like bulk of, you know, um, sink or swim experience came from. And I learned a whole lot. Um, I've always joked that working in those kind of settings is like living in dog years. You see mm -hmm. way more clients and way more presentations of things. Um, you, you just can't match the experience. You know, I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. Um, 
because if you're not licensed and you don't know what you're doing necessarily and there's no one there with you, it's quite a ride. I mean, that's and, corporate psychiatry for you, you know? Yeah. And then when I found my way out of there, I found my way into a PHP and IOP um, outpatient substance abuse treatment facility there in Savannah as well. And I worked various positions within that um, federal probation, uh, DUI court, um, day treatment, all kinds of things, assessment, all sorts of stuff. And then I moved here. So the bulk of my experience there, and I was on what's called an ACT team. I believe you guys have those here mm -hmm. too. Yeah. It's a community mental health team. And so you, know, you went to people's homes and you could see all kinds of things there. And so, um, you know, I did that. I did MCOT. You, you did? I, yeah, I did MCOT for a few years, uh, both in Travis County and Bastrop Lee and Fayette counties. I wouldn't trade it. Oh, you I learned it. so much. I would have done it for forever, but we know that in a lot of hospitals and mental health settings, sometimes administrative things aren't um, the best. So with the ACT team, I actually loved it. I would have probably continued doing it if I'd stayed in Savannah, only because of the team I had. I was working with the nurse on my team was one of the nurses I'd worked with at the psych hospital. So was the psychiatrist. But I mean, we were we were trying to keep people stable enough that they didn't have to be re-hospitalized and it, and it worked. And I don't know if I've had very many jobs where I worked for other people that I felt that much like impact, mm -hmm. like what we were supposed to be doing and what was coming out the other side matched. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really about the people I was working with. But yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it. I learned a whole, whole lot. And, you know, I think you learn, um, you learn how to follow your gut. Really good skills. Yeah. 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 Skills like that. Skills that you mm -hmm. can't pay for. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Walking into people home, people's homes, especially, you know, that can be dangerous. We live in Texas. There's guns, you know, and, um, you know, you just, you learn to rely on that for skill and safety. Yes. And on the other side of it, I learned very quickly, you know, some shortcuts to let people see my authenticity because on the other side of it, I'm a stranger coming into your home. How do I present in a way that makes mm -hmm. you feel comfortable? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's twofold. And, you know, it, it varies by culture too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So at Hiatus Wellness, do y'all, do you accept insurance? So Hiatus Wellness was newly formed. I've been in private practice as a sole proprietor on my own for a while now. And I am in the process of creating a situation where I can have other clinicians work with me. I am currently paneled with insurance. I'm in the process of getting the group practice paneled on those same insurance panels as well. Mm -hmm. That shouldn't be too difficult of a transition. It doesn't look like it. And it looks like I can continue to function under my current credentialing with them until the new credentialing comes into play. So that's nice. People don't have to have a gap in care. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, do you have any sledding scale appointments? I do. And I don't, I don't have a number or a percentage. Uh, it's just a matter of, you know, do I have really room? And right now I think most of us are pretty full. Um, mm -hmm but I'll, I'll, I'll squeeze myself and make space sometimes when someone that I've seen before reaches out and maybe they no longer are insured. Um, so they don't have to go start over somewhere else. Yeah. What about weekend or evening appointments? So I go until 7 PM on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then I do Saturday mornings also. Cool. I do um, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, 10 to 7, Wednesday, 10 to 8.30, and every other Sunday from 10 to 6. Okay. Well, you know, full disclosure, um, I'm, I'm a mama. I haven't been one a super long time, but, um, you know, I'm working around the pandemic like most people. 
Mm -hmm. I haven't stopped working, but I'm also, you know, very cognizant of like the risks that are out there for daycares and things like that. And so, you know, my personal choice was to keep her home, but that also means I can't work like I was working uh, because my husband is also working from home. So that's an interesting uh, little dance that we do where one of us goes into the office and works and the other one comes out and we switch um, for childcare reasons. And so, um, you know, hopefully in 2021, we find ourselves some stability and good footing that will go back to the way that it was where it's a little bit um, fuller of a schedule. Yeah. Is being a therapist your first career? If not, what was? <laughs> first career, uh, as far as a career goes, yes. First job, no. Um, I've done lots of things. So I self-identify as poor white trash. And I don't I don't mean that in, in it, it's, I totally apply that label to myself. That's how I grew up. I'm from um, the Bible Belt, the south, south part of Alabama, where all industry has left. All manufacturing has left. Um, it's very poor. Um, and that's how I grew up. And that was, you know, the latter part of my teens and early 20s. You know, I did manufacturing jobs. I've worked in what we call their chicken houses. I don't know what they're called here. Um, and I've been told people can't believe, you know, that I did some of the things that I did. But, you know, picked up dead chickens for 10 bucks an hour. And I've sewn shirts. I used to work at a Van Heusen factory and I sewed shirts for two years. Um, that's how I got through college. I've waited all kinds of tables and all kinds of restaurants and I uh, can carry tray like nobody's business still. Um, physical therapy. Um, I was a model for a short time way back um, when that made sense. And all kinds of things in between. Um, I think all of it kind of informs being a therapist. Um, For sure. You know, I've met a lot of therapists that have only ever worked as like techs and this is like the only field they've ever known. But um, I think a lot of my empathy and understanding and non-judgment comes from um, wearing myself out. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And knowing what that's like. Yeah, well that and... I think that when we are privileged, even if we recognize our privilege, sometimes we can't quite understand things to the same degree that somebody who's been through the ringer or, you know, somebody who self-identifies as poor white trash, like, you know, you've had more experiences than some people have had, which gives you insight and empathy into your clients' lives who may, you know, work similar jobs and, you know, busting their ass um, and not making much money, you know, so you have an understanding of what that's like. And I think that life experience when being a therapist is invaluable. Agreed. Yeah. And so I'm not for everybody. Um, and some people might be offended by that, like self-proclaimed label, but um, I kind of still identify that way a lot of times. <laughs> that's, do you, that's boo. My first line of thought about a lot of things comes from that place. Um, and so I worked, I think, a lot with underserved populations. Makes sense. What drew you to being a therapist? I really wanted to understand why I was seeing some of the things that I was seeing around me. Mm -hmm. In my community, uh, in my family of origin, um, I just just couldn't make sense of it. So that was kind of the start of it. And then once I started taking classes, I realized my brain was kind of made for it. Like I, it made sense to me and I didn't, I didn't struggle with it. Like I saw some people, you know, it just, it all made sense to me. And so I thought, well, I mean, this certainly seems like a sign to keep down this path. If I'm good at it and I can make sense of it, then we'll just keep moving forward with it. And I kept moving forward and kept moving forward. The next thing I knew I had a master's. That's awesome. 
what sorts of things do you enjoy doing in your quote unquote free time? <laughs> I'm sure as being a, a mom and a therapist and a wife, you don't have a lot of it. Well, I don't know how I might have answered that pre pandemic because it's been, you know, so many months now. So uh, right. I will say free time, you know, we joke about like with air quotes around it. Now, free time and professional time and personal time and all seems to kind of been stirred together. Mm -hmm. um, and so the best I can do is, um, you know, like this Saturday, I have a, a friend coming over and we're going to socially distanced make soap. <laughs> like, I have no idea how to make soap, but we bought a book and we're going to do it. Like, <laughs> that's awesome. Um, you know, I'm a diehard um, attempting to do Pinterest projects and failing at them, like attempting to grow plants and killing them. Like, I really want to be crafty so bad. Um, I haven't quite figured out how to, to work it out for myself yet, but my hobby is trying. My hobby, my hobby is trying to be crafty, not being crafty, but trying. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not for me, but I'm like, I'm just going to keep trying, you know, until I find something that I can do. I respect that. <laughs> <laughs> As I say it out loud, I'm like, that sounds <laughs> so obnoxious. Like, I'm just going to keep doing this thing I'm terrible at. No, I, I mean, I, I think that that's, that speaks to like your commitment to yourself, really. So, you know, talking about schema and narrative therapy, um, what drew you to it? I did my internship while I was still in my master's program at a facility in Alabama. And I had an old school male therapist as my supervisor. And by old school, I just mean like really classically trained, but he was old enough to be a little out there and not really um, as rigid as some younger therapists can be when they're, you know, pretty new. And his whole thing was schema therapy. And I did my practical in both my internships in that PHP program. And so I got to watch for a year, the implementation of it, how he used it. Um, so then when I left and started, you know, doing big girl work that people weren't using it and I could see all these opportunities, it didn't quite make sense to me why we weren't doing it. And so, you know, I started pulling out my binder of all these, you know, my type A binder of all these things I've collected um, and using it and it resonates with people. So Again, if it if it works and makes sense, you just keep moving forward with it. Mm -hmm. What would you say are the basic tenets of schema therapy? So I will say the person that created schema therapy, Dr. Young, there are 18 schemas. And to, to mm -hmm. go through all of it would be, you know, quite an in-depth endeavor. Um, there is a <laughs> webinar on NADAC's website that I did a couple of years ago that does go fully in-depth that, you know, people can watch if they want to. But the basics, if you whittle it down, my the supervisor that I was talking about, the way he explained it, which is still the best I've ever heard, is if you think about the idea of like a blueprint or a schematic, that a schema is our blueprint for how we are formed. It It is the underpinning of how we think things should be built or made. And until we really examine what our schemas are and where we got them from, we're going to keep rebuilding the same house over and over because it's the only blueprint we have. And so, you know, holding that in with narrative therapy, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on our stories that we develop. Um, you know, schemas being our belief systems and then narrative therapy, both focusing on that story. Um, my little trademarked line is the story always wins. And I built that on that exposure to schema therapy and watching it with people I actually said it one day in a group that I was running in an inpatient drug and alcohol treatment center here, not far from here. And uh, one of the guys in group was one of those really great ones that is a little resistant and was giving me a hard time. And he was like, I've heard all this before. And in the most empathetic way I can, I said, and yet here we are in the same room in a treatment center. So what that means is you do know all of it in your logical decision-making, knowledge storing part of your brain. You do know all this. I believe that. I believe you've probably been to enough high quality treatment. You could run this group. 
but something's wrong. Something is going on that that knowledge isn't doing you any good. So if our knowledge isn't doing us any good and we can recite all the right things and we know all the answers, then our knowledge is not actually the whole answer. Our beliefs are the rest of it. And so we need to look at why it is you know all these things, but your behavior is not able to match it. Our behavior really actually tells a story of what we believe. So I joke that like people are liars and they don't mean to be, but people say whatever they think is the right answer. They say whatever will endear you to them. They say what will cause them the least amount of shame. They say the things that they have a lot of morality attached to. And so people end up actually saying what they wish was the answer because they have an aspirational self. But if you look at their behavior, a lot of times it doesn't match. And the behavior is the telltale. You know, if I hurt myself and harm myself and subject myself to pain, I don't love myself. I want to love myself, maybe. Maybe I know of a whole bunch of tools for how to, but for some reason I don't believe that that's um, something I'm entitled to, or I don't believe there's enough love in the world to go around. Maybe I have a scarcity-based schema. So, you know, the basic tenant of it is what are the stories I tell myself about myself and what I deserve in the world and how much is for me and how much is for other people um, and where did I get it from so I can kind of dismantle it and take out the parts that don't really serve me and aren't even really true so I can live the life that I say I want to and my behaviors can match my words. Right. So our schemas then can distort and impact our interpretation of our experiences. Oh my gosh, can they? Um, how can't they? You know? Um, how might that show up? What would that look like? Well, I'm forming my... <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm a little rambly, as you can probably tell. So I'll just take a, you know, jump in, put on your seatbelt. Um, how can they? So let's we'll use me for an example. Um, you know, a little bit of that background information I gave you, it probably wouldn't be a stretch for you to imagine that there were some schema belief systems built in to my way of wandering through the world. Um, and I actually didn't really wrap my brain around that that's what it was until I went to a training about seven years ago before Brene Brown was on Jimmy Fallon and, you know, was interviewing the vice president elect, uh, or the vice president now president elect, um, when really the only people that had heard of her were the other mental health clinicians and um, academics. And Renee Brown, she gets it, man. And the way she talks about beliefs and that they're values based, and she talks a lot about scarcity, that we are afraid to show up in our authenticity and be vulnerable because we have this idea that there's like not enough understanding to go around. There's not enough empathy to go around, that we're not enough. You know, I'm not blank enough, smart enough, rich enough, pretty enough, thin enough, whatever your enough is um, to get where you'd like to go, that somehow you're not like that, that avenue is not open for you based on lots of life experiences. And the, the thing is our scheme is formed so early. You know, if you think about how early our personalities start forming, that's part of it. Um, you know, schemas can be changed a lot easier the younger someone is for the same reason a lot of other things can be changed the younger you are. You know, our beliefs become a lot more rigid as we age. Um, and we go around with our confirmation bias collecting information to back up our beliefs. And so it gets a little harder as we age. Um, but, you know, when we're small, every single life experience we have informs our set of beliefs. And so can it impact Yes, it not only can impact, it absolutely does impact, not even on a conscious level. You don't get to go, I choose this scheme to impact what I'm doing today. Um, it's absolutely impacting. So the problem becomes that all the places that we collected data from as we're growing up are not all like credible sources of information. Um, and so if you have parents who have their own scarcity beliefs, if you have parents who have their own um, shame-based behaviors and belief systems, if you have parents that have their own uh, 
you know, inability to put off instant gratification, then our ideas about food and love and belonging are all super skewed. Um, and it's not because we just made up a bunch of crazy stuff about how the world works uh, because we decided to live in a fairy tale. We have real experiences to back up our beliefs. We just don't ever consider that our experiences were maybe, you know, pulled from a place, you know, what if you had had parents that said, um, we love you no matter what, what if you had had, um, a different socioeconomic status, you know, how many things go into the way you think the world works that are so small, it's like minutious stuff that underlies all of the way we think about how the world works and how it doesn't work and why it works the way that it does. It impacts all of that. And if you think about, you know, if we're walking file cabinets, all of us, every time I encounter a person, you know, I encounter you, you encounter me. Oh, it happens a lot to me that people encounter me and they hear my accent and I can, I can see, and some people are, you know, bold enough or authentic enough to have conversation with me about it, that their first interpretation of me is really, it actually is poor white trash. If you meet me the way I'm dressed today, certainly with my ripped jeans and I'm not, not wearing like a, like a blazer, uh, people hear my accent and I can see a lot of beliefs based in the way I sound. You're a hick, you're a redneck, you're, you know, a lot of things that people assume about you and what I'm capable of. And so if, you know, other people have their own assumptions, I probably have my own assumptions too about myself, about other people, not even just the way they look, the way they sound, the way they dress, the way they carry themselves. Um, and that goes all the way up into, you know, do I believe I'm capable of getting better as far as like self-growth work, you know, recovery and sobriety from alcohol or substances, you know, do I believe that I can start a new fitness routine? Do I believe that I can go back to college? Do I believe it's under everything? Because what's under all that then is going to be, how do I make it work? Well, do you have the, how do I make it work skill set? Why or why not? That's all schema related. And so we're walking around as this walking file cabinet. And every time we interact with a person or a thing or a place or an idea, our brain just is rifling through files and it's going, what do we know about girls that sound country? What do we know about money and how it's distributed and the fairness and equality of that system? What do we know about college? What do we know about, you know, um, anything, everything, everybody. What do we know about love? What do we know about what it takes to belong? And the thing is that our brain opens that file and every experience we've had related to that idea is in there, except a lot of those experiences are fraught with pain and, you know, poor sources of information and abuse sometimes, you know, at the hands of people that look like this person I'm encountering, you know, and this person reminds me of it, it's in everything. And so I think the problem is even those of us that grow up and try to rework things and we try to do some healing and figure some things out. Um, we still sometimes don't bother going back and going through all those files and looking into everything and saying, where did I get this? And sometimes the answer will be, I have no idea. I literally, no one ever told me this. This is an verbal message I ever got. It's a message you got because you were observing other people and the way they behaved or it's something you saw on TV or, you know, some other kid said this to you. And we don't ever consider that there's another part of it that I, I the, the example I always use because it's my own personal example of a time that it clicked with me about how this works is, the church I was raised in way back in Alabama as a child, in my mind as an early adult, I had not been in a while. And I had this idea in my head of like, you know, grandness. <laughs> and, and I go back to visit for something and it was super small. It's country church. And it clicked with me that, well, how, how big is a room to a child when you're small? How many rooms do you have it to compare it to? How, how much experience do you have with large forums? You know, your lunchroom at school, maybe football games, like not much. And then as you age, you encounter more large rooms, you encounter more churches, you encounter. And so we have much more of a spectrum to add this experience to. 
But if we never go back and revisit that belief or that church so that we can go, oh, I'm bigger. And now I realize this is normal size. This is a normal size room. You know, we don't go back and look at an old belief and go, well, I believe that because I didn't understand the concept because I was eight. Or I believe that because a grown up told it to me and grown ups know everything. And now you're a grown up and you realize grown ups don't know everything. <laughs> you know, can it? It absolutely does in, in every single possible way. What are cognitive distortions or thinking errors? That's such a great question. Um, probably if I, if I use the example of when we personalize things, and what I mean by personalize is if an event is happening in your vicinity or you're having an interaction and you think, that that person's behavior or what's happening is because of you. It's happening because they're upset with you or because you don't really belong there or, you know, and not because anyone has said that and not because there are any, you know, glaring outward signs, but it's, it's happening inside of you and you're going, are they mad at me because I was late? Are they mad at me because, you know, I did this yesterday? Are they, and then if you actually ask, it has nothing to do with you. And you're reading something into it because you're always carrying around and am I good enough searching for the ways that you can people please and make sure that no one finds fault with you so that you can, you know, avoid criticism and blame and shame. Um, That's a good example of a, a cognitive distortion is my mind is telling me something I have no evidence for. And so, you know, a popular phrase for that is like feelings versus facts. Um, or, you know, I'll say like emotions versus evidence, but it's, is the way I'm feeling supported by any evidence or any facts? Not that the way you're feeling isn't true, because of course, if you're feeling it, you're feeling it, that's, (laughs) that is correct. But is it based on my own fears and doubts? Or is it based on someone's actual treatment of me? You know, or am I reading into probably a lot of situations I go into, I read into um, that I have something to prove and that if I don't do X, Y, Z, I won't be liked. Um, I find it easier to explain those with an example like that than to give like a definition. Um, But it's when our our thinking is just not supported by any facts or evidence, if, if that makes sense. Okay. And what about core beliefs? What are those? So if you have kids or if you like to watch cartoons, and I had seen this before I had a kid, so it's because I like to watch cartoons. There's a Pixar movie called Inside Out, which is amazing. (laughs) If you haven't watched it, it's really clever. And I've, I've joked, but I think I'm probably right, that whoever made that movie has been to lots of therapy or they must have had therapists consult on that movie because it's so perfect. And they show you kind of how core memories are made and core memories and core beliefs are really not that different. It's, you know, what you learn about why it's okay or not okay to show emotion, why it's okay or not okay to um, be mad or be sad. Um, Core beliefs are this at the very center or core of us ideas that we have about the world and how it works that are really under everything. Um, And they're very closely tied to our values. And so a lot of times, whatever values, and I don't mean like good values versus bad values. I mean, what you were taught was important. We'll have a lot of beliefs around those, around what it takes to get those things or maintain those things, or, you know, what, what it means to be a good person. Um, and sometimes our core beliefs are accurate. You know, they're, they're not distorted at all. I actually will tell people a lot of times, if you're sitting in a room with me, you're doing something right because you've survived. And so we don't want to erase everything. Something's working. Uh, it may not be working to the best that it could be. You know, it may not be fine-tuned, but you've got some skills that work work because not only you're sitting in a room with me in one piece, you somehow figured out how to access the resource to find me. You figured out like there are a lot of things in play just for us to be interacting. And so our, our, our ideas about what we deserve can be changed. Our, our core values and beliefs 
can be fine tuned and they don't all have to be changed just because we're doing schema work doesn't mean that we have to change everything just because we're doing narrative work doesn't mean your story is all wrong but it might need some editing let's talk about self-fulfilling prophecies let's talk about it <laughs> what comes to mind when when i say that I literally, because I'm so weird and, and like my brain does visual pictures with phrases and, and which is why I have the whole file cabinet thing. And mm -hmm. um, so I actually imagine a person like unrolling a scroll, like, <laughs> and it says, hear ye, hear ye. Noah is only capable of blah, blah, blah. Um, and then we go and we manifest that and make it happen. Because really, if we go with the story always wins, that is that is basically like I'm going to go fulfill whatever prophecy I've been foretold. And so whatever I believe, I'm going to go manifest in the world. If I believe great things, I will manifest those. If I think I'm probably pretty smart and I can probably maybe pull myself up a little, but not too far. Like I'm not that smart. I'm not, that's exactly where you'll land. Just, you know, right in the middle. Um, it's why we pick the people that we love. It's why we pick the people that are in our lives as adults, you know, because we have the power to choose that. We will fulfill whatever our belief system has framed for us, um, which is why it's so important to examine them and maybe kind of rifle through them and pull some things out that you know don't belong anymore um i'll use an example when i moved here uh i was married to a different person i moved here from another state with my first husband and i had a lot of i was raised super religiously um and I had this idea about what it means to not only to be married, but to be a good wife. And what it means um, to like try and put in an effort. Um, and what sacrifice means. And there was a lot of values attached to that and morality attached to that and old core belief systems attached to that and wanting to prove things wrong. And, you know, if you think about self-fulfilling prophecy, if the idea is that um, you're supposed to make it work no matter what, you make it work no matter what, even if you shouldn't, like even if uh, if everybody would be better off in the end if you didn't, um, it could lead to a lot of pain. It certainly did for me until I was like, but what if, oh, but what if I could do something <laughs> else? Um, and what does that look like? I had no idea. No idea what that could look like because that's the only frame I had. And when you're when you're able to kind of just like pan out and look at other things and not just what you have in frame, you can go, so this could look different. I think this could be different. I think I could feel different. I think my life could look different. But when you're just stuck in like it has to fit in here and has to fit in this belief in this box, and if you're surrounding yourself with people that perpetuate that set of beliefs, um, whether it's the people that instill those beliefs in you, or if it's just people around you, you know, that are stuck in some negative beliefs themselves, you're, you're not going to probably have it done on you that like, what if I decided I wanted it to be different? And do I have all the knowledge? Yes, I was a therapist. Yeah. <laughs> so talking about that client sitting in a group saying, I know all this. It's like, tell me about it, bud. Tell me about it. Yeah, I know what it's like to know all this and you still can't explain why stuff's a hot mess. The, the beliefs, because the knowledge isn't the issue. That's why can't I put the knowledge into practice? Sustainably. Yeah. So how does one go about changing that? Well, so... You know, schema therapy really is a combination of like a lot of really classic therapies like CBT. Um, so you can use CBT. Um, a lot of just like challenging, 
challenging beliefs, talk therapy, you know, we have, we have all these no, new interventions that we know about now that are hyper successful. And we forget that talk therapy still works. Mm -hmm. um, In mysterious ways. <laughs> ways. And so what I've found is um, journaling is super helpful. And sometimes it's actually helpful to get a person to write a literal story. It depends on the, it depends on the therapist's approach. It depends on what clients are into. If you hate journaling and writing, like you're going to quit because no thanks. Um, you know, sometimes expressive art and having people um, we we've done before in one of my retreats, you can take like particularly a book that at one time held a lot of power over you, good or bad. Um, this may seem like a big, big no-no to some people, but I've had people use Bibles. I've had people use books of poetry that represent something to them. Um, dictionaries, encyclopedias, like whatever, whatever holds some meaning for you and then actually collage the pages over or redact words to create a different story giving them some sort of sensory tie to the idea that I can take something that's the original story I was working with and I can actually redo it, like literally redo it and create a whole new book or story. Um, there's lots of, well, and if, if you love that idea, it's probably because that speaks to you. Whereas, you know, maybe writing a story, you're like, no, thank you. That sounds like homework. Um, <laughs> it really depends on the, on the client's personality, what speaks to them. Some people struggle with journaling, you know, um, and some people want really specific direction. Like they don't want to just, just sit and talk. Um, and so you can actually give them a schema assessment. So there's actually a tool. If you go to schematherapy.org, it's Dr. Young's site. And there's tons of information on there and lots of little, there's a few like just videos you can watch you know, you don't have to be a clinician that is for just, you know, the lay person that explains it um, in, in, in very like succinct, simple terms. Um, but they also sell the inventories that actually tell you which schemas you have. And so as a therapist, you can go buy um, a subscription basically that's good for a year so that you can use those inventories in practice. Um, it's not super expensive at all. It's about $90 so like a year. For you know, so yeah, for basically unlimited prints, but um, so those inventories obviously are a huge part of like how do you begin the work? Is well, first let's figure out what we're working with because we can probably guess and say sounds like a little scarcity, sounds like some you know self esteem and self worth, but um, to actually get a really good handle on because sometimes people, although they are the experts on themselves. They're also like, you're counting on them to be able to see all the holes. And so an inventory helps someone else interpret what all might be going on. And then you can work from there, depending on which schemas they have, of course, conversation would look different than it would with other things, you know, and they're kind of grouped together with some being about self-esteem and some being about shame and some being about um, entitlement and an inability to put off, um, instant gratification, you know, which of course a lot of process addictions fall in. And so everybody's is going to look a little bit different, um, which is kind of nice. That's how, you know, it's not just like cookie cutter. Yeah. So who, who will schema and narrative therapy benefit? I can't think of anybody. It wouldn't benefit. I mean, of course, people who have the ability to, conceptualize, you know, so, you know, I wouldn't, I probably would not do with like pre-adolescent or pre-teen age. Um, you can use a lot of the concepts still. I mean, core belief work certainly is still useful, um, particularly if they're trying to fetter out messages they're getting from their friends and whether, you know, those things about them are true and, but, you know, on brand schema work, I would say, late teens and adults, but otherwise I wouldn't put any other parameters around it. I think anybody could benefit from it. Um, especially, I will say not just these people, but especially people who find themselves in patterns of behavior where they're doing things, even though they know, you know, again, like I have this knowledge, why am I not able to, why am I not able to change my behavior? I know what to do. 
Um, you know, and I've joked with clients about if knowledge was all it took, we wouldn't have any doctors or nurses that smoke. <laughs> so clearly, you know, you wouldn't have any marriage and family therapists that have been divorced. You wouldn't, or, you know, they wouldn't, they would never even marry a person that wasn't right for them. So that's not what it is. There's something else going on. And so if you find yourself repeating patterns over and over, even when you have tools and knowledge, that this is probably a good place to look. Um, well, shifting gears a little bit, kind of going back to you, shifting away from the schema and narrative therapy, um, what kind of experience do you have working with particularly vulnerable clients, such as those who are transgender, undocumented, or BIPOC, BIPOC to name a few examples? That's a pretty significant portion of my caseload currently, and I, can, I attribute that to the fact that I am in a college town. And so although San Marcos is a mid-sized city, um, the university draws in both, both uh, students and staff. And so, you know, you get uh, professors and academics from all over as well, um, especially those that are research-based. And so, you know, we're also in a beautiful part of the country. And so I don't know if you've noticed, we're not very far from Wimberley. It's a hot retirement spot. It's a hot spot for, you know, people on vacation. Um, and people that want to get away from Austin as it grows. And so I don't know that I would necessarily have the same caseload where I in a different part of Texas. Um, and I haven't sought those people out. What I find I think is I'm referred because, because someone they know or love has seen me. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, it seems to be, you know, every single person actually now that I'm saying that is either referred by a friend or family or another professional that they have run into that, that pointed them in my direction, either because of the Brene Brown work that I do or, mm -hmm. you know, the fact that, you know, I don't label it and brand it as um, people in transition. I do talk about that. I work with people who are in major life adjustment or transition of any kind. Have you moved from across the nation? Um, have you gone through major surgery for weight loss? Have you recently gone through divorce? Have you started college or are you about to graduate and you don't know what to do? Uh, any major life transitions or adjustments? Yeah. Okay. How are your sessions structured, if any? How are they structured? Can you be more specific about exactly what you mean? Well, some people might have like uh, a certain way they open up the session. The middle part of the session may involve a certain doing a certain aspect of the work, and then you may have some sort of, you know, conclusion. Um, I, I heard that completely differently at first for some reason. So the one thing that is probably a thread throughout everyone is, you know, how my sessions are structured is going to be highly personalized for each mm -hmm. person. Um, I, I, I want to say always, but that's, you know, those are never 100% accurate, always, never. Um, the overwhelming majority of the time I give homework, what I will call homework, um, which is sometimes actual writing and it's sometimes like food for thought that I would like for people, I'll tell them like, just put bullets in your phone. It doesn't have to be journaling, just like Every time you think about us having this conversation again and you kind of redigest it, take a quick note of what was going on. Take a quick note of did it occur to you in a different way? Um, and I'll usually say, like, you know, it's going to happen when you're brushing your teeth or when you're in the shower or when you're driving. <laughs> shower thoughts. So, and so just taking notes because we don't process like we don't do this. And then we're like, nice interview. Nice to meet you. Done. Click. Done. <laughs> Throw it away. We'll think about, you know, what you wish you'd asked or what I wish I'd said or not said for a day or two after. And it's that way. That's how we process everything. It's how we process when we go watch movies. And then the next day, your mind's kind of replaying parts of it. And you go, oh, I didn't catch that at first. Oh, um, that's the same thing with therapy. And so we'll have a session. And even if you feel very like relieved and fulfilled the next day, there will be parts that we talked about that your brain is able to extract more from now that it's had space. And so I like for you to write that down, like as you gain perspective and insight, sometimes it's free journaling like that, or sometimes I give very specific questions. So based on what we just talked about, 
making lists, doing assignments, you know, it comes to mind one that I gave somebody yesterday, having a whole conversation about mom, lots of negative inner uh, energy and emotions around mom and their homework is to write down all the ways they're like their mom. Yikes, you know, but yeah, because what's happening is we're having this pattern of behavior that we know is not good and that we want to change. And we look, it looks just like this person's behavior that we know is super unhealthy and yet we're doing it, you know, and we want to villainize them, but we look just like them. Um, and so I really like to give homework because it, it seems to make people feel tethered to the experience they had with me until next time it feels like they're doing something and it feels productive, you know, that they're not just wandering in the desert until the next time they walk in or zoom in. Um, <laughs> and sometimes it makes them think of a whole new question that I didn't ask that they can then bring back. Um, so it's just a nice way to keep them connected, I think. Yeah, I love giving homework to them totally there with you on that um what about an initial session with you what can a client expect unfortunately like most therapists initial sessions are more robotic than any of us would like because there's so much there's so much data collection there's so much information gathering so with that said i will actually start out by like just saying that naming it in the room and saying promise that I'm a lot more interesting than this is about to be. <laughs> but we need all this information or else in a month you're going to go, oh yeah, by the way, did I ever tell you blah, 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 blah. And I'll go, I should have asked that. Um, so we really have to cover all that stuff up front. And so just, I think naming it, people are kind of expecting that anyway. But if you say like, this is what's happening, this is why I have to do it. It's a lot less like you leave and you just dumped a whole bunch of your experience on this person and you don't feel like you got anything back. And so that's also why I'll do, why I'll do homework sometimes. Um, you know, what would progress look like to you? Maybe the homework assignment after the first session, something like that, that helps you feel like you're able to like, like actually put, make some sense out of what all we just did. An assessment is a super invasive process. Um, and you can feel all mixed up because it's usually a bunch of questions that we never have to address all at once. Like there are no other situations in life, you know, um, and so just like saying that when we start and I'll usually also lay out some like basic, let's do a verbal contract about what this is going to be like, because therapists are all different. And just because you've been to therapy before, doesn't mean that's what this is going to be like. And, you know, this is where my country comes into play. <laughs> One of my rules is you can say anything you want in here, literally anything. I'm not easily offended. I swear more than I should. I won't do it in here, but just so you know, you're not going to say something in the inside. I go, oh, um, here's yeah. the catch. But here's the catch. You can say anything you want. You can talk crazy, say anything. You can say stuff that other people would go, you can't say that. That's terrible. What a terrible person. You'll say it and I'll go, you know, be that way sometimes. But what you can't do is talk crazy to me. And I'll never talk crazy to you. And what I mean, by that, you know, if you need some in some country interpretations, I will never be disrespectful to you or speak to you in a way that feels like I don't care about you. And my expectation is that you'll do the same. Um, you know, we do a quick coverage of confidentiality. Um, I reference Fight Club and I say, if you see somebody in the lobby that you know, no, you didn't. Because the first rule of Fight Club is that there is no Fight Club. And that's how confidentiality works. If you tell somebody you see me, so they come see me and they go, oh, my friend Noah comes to see you. I'll go, well, I'm glad that someone that you know um, feels that I'm good enough to take care of somebody that they love. And if I see you in the grocery store, I'll give you like a little like a sup nod and that's it. Uh, if you want to speak to me, you're going to have to come over. I do like a quick run through of those things and then we do an assessment. Um, but I talk pretty fast that so we usually can get it done and still have some sort of like eye contact before we're done where we can actually go, how do you feel about all that? That was a lot. Mm -hmm. but I mean, I can't imagine um, that we're all doing their first therapy sessions so differently that that would be shocking to anyone. I would hope not. <laughs> right, we would hope not. Let's, yeah, true. Um, how would you say your clients would describe or experience you? That's a good question. I don't think I saw that on the list. 
how would my clients describe? You know, as, as like, as it probably seems with, you know, the way I label myself and all that, I actually think I'm pretty warm. Um, there's so much junk in the world, you know, you should have somewhere where you feel like someone actually cares whether they see you or not. Um, I try to create a physical space as far as like furnishing and lighting and things that just feels like maybe a little sitting area in your friend's house, like just a little corner where you sit and talk. Um, how they would describe me. I'm trying to think of reviews that I've read. Probably just safe. Pretty safe. It's a good word to kind of describe you. Are you the type of therapist who will laugh or cry with your clients? I will laugh with you all day long. And I might upset somebody. I hope not. I hope I don't upset you. Um, crying with clients, of course, there are exceptions to everything. I've witnessed it before with other people, with supervisees in, in treatment centers, and the feedback I would get from clients about their therapist when they would come to me about it was, you know, I felt like I couldn't share something with her because she was too fragile. I felt like um, they made it about them. I felt like, you know, it wasn't, I didn't have as much air in the room anymore. And so I'm very mindful now. Have I allowed them to see that that emotion is in there? Oh, yeah. Um, you know, in my darkest places, my experience you know, despite growing up very religiously as an adult and going through a lot of things that were a lot more gray and not black and white. I have had experiences where I have reached into the ether desperately flailing and grasping to feel something. And, and I found nothing. And when I say that to people, I always say it just like that because it's exactly the way I've always worded it because that's exactly what it felt like. And I will allow you to see in my eyes what that feels like. And I think that's enough. Beyond that, I begin, I begin to take up space and air in the room. That's not mine. Um, but I have found that sharing things like that sometimes that people don't say out loud, like you can't, you can't um, have been deeply religious and then say that you reached out and, and felt like the ether was empty. And then people feel more inclined to share yeah that is what it feels like it's hard to feel tethered to earth when you don't when you don't feel like there's a purpose um i think there are ways to communicate your empathy and and even communicate your own experience that can be very impactful and helpful without taking up space that's not yours does that answer that yeah yeah no i mean i think everybody defers when it comes to crying with their clients. I've, I've gotten so many different answers so far. And I think it's, I think it's a matter of, like you said, awareness of the space that you take up is what it all boils down to. Because that time in session with clients is not our time at all. Um, so anything, I think any emotion that would come up in session um, you know, if you were to share that or express it, like that's not appropriate, right? So um, crying to me seems like it can take up a lot of space sometimes. Yeah. But I will say, I, I will say that I have had clients that I've met with where, you know, something was just very sad, you know, and I can't help that tears would, you know, fall down my cheek. I don't say, oh my gosh, I'm crying so much for you right now. You know, just let it be, you wipe it away and you keep on doing what you're doing, you know? Um, I think that we're only human and those things are bound to happen sometimes. Sure. I think, you know, this is a good, this is a good 
part of conversation. I think as a supervisor, my caution is always to make sure that you're working on your own stuff so that it's not coming from a place of that you need it more than the client does. You need the right. expression of that emotion more than they do is more right. my, my concern always. Um, and because I would never want a client to feel like I'm one more person in the world that they have to emotionally prop up. Right. But I've been in, you know, family workshops where, you know, when I worked in alcohol and drug treatment, I ran our family workshops and I've been in situations where something blindsided me and it was so powerful um, that you could see like the expression on my face was the, like there was no fix in that. Like that was just and why fix it? You know, let it let it be known. Like that was a big deal what you just did or said. Um, but I, I do tread lightly around sadness because I'm I'm always wary that it is coming from a place of uh, needing to do more personal work, I guess. With exceptions to every rule, of course. Of course. Um, how do you define holding space for someone? How do I define holding space? I love this question. I think this is probably my favorite question. I might ramble all kinds of different directions. <laughs> group is my favorite thing in the whole wide world to do. And I've been in groups where I was certain there was a there was a entity in the room that was not of our realm. Because it's so powerful when people decide to get vulnerable, it is so contagious and so powerful. And our job is to try to contain as much of that for as long as possible, that magic. Um, because it's so healing. There's There's so much belonging in it and there's so much comfort and safety in it that, you know, to hold space is to try to retain as much safety and comfort and air, air in the room to try to keep as much of that in play as possible. So there as much healing can happen in that space as possible. Um, Cause if you've ever been, not even just in a group, in, in any space where you just felt like somebody got you and you felt like you could, you know, open up a few more boxes and it would be okay. You know, that person was holding space for you. That's how that happened. And it doesn't have to be a professional. You know, lots of people are capable of holding space. The problem is that a lot of people don't necessarily have access to a person in their personal life that they feel like unconditionally loves them to the degree that they could hold space for them without inserting themselves into the space. Mm -hmm. What's, what's the best advice you've ever received from a supervisor? That I never received from a supervisor? The best advice. Chat with people. You know, eat with them if you can. Is there, if you know, if you've got like a cup of coffee on your side table, I found that that elicits more conversation if you each have a cup of coffee or something, a piece of chocolate. Um, it's such an act of normalcy, right? <laughs> to have something um, to do with your hands and, um, you know, to give yourself something to be doing while you do the bigger work of talking. Um, it makes you more of a person. I like that. That's interesting. I never thought about it that way before, but you are right. Like when people are busy with their hands or there's something else to do, they, they tend to divulge a lot more. What have you personally learned about yourself and or the world through your practice? There's enough. There's more than enough. Of everything. <laughs> um, and as I stepped into private practice, one, some of the gift that I've been given from other clinicians is their helpfulness and learning and realizing that there's also enough 
there's enough clients to go around because there's plenty of pain in the world and that we don't have to treat each other like competition and we don't have to withhold help or advice or wisdom that could, you know, bring someone else a little bit of space in their life or joy or help them along the path. Um, because there's enough, there's enough for all of us. There's enough ideas. There's enough money. There's enough clients. We talked a little earlier about you and your trying at crafts. Uh, <laughs> what other things do you do to take care of yourself? I love yoga. I, I'm also a yoga teacher. Um, but when I say yoga, I don't necessarily mean just the asanas, just the, just the poses, just the physical part. Um, just being in my body and spending time paying attention to my body. And a lot of intuitive movement that probably doesn't look like what people think of when they think of yoga, but, you know, taking time to notice what part of me feels like it needs moving and then moving it in a way that, does that feel good? Yeah, that feels good. Because that is mind body connection. We're, we're not taking notes on it and it's not being facilitated necessarily, but I found that to be super helpful during this time, not just the pandemic, but the election through the anxieties of, you know, needing to go to the grocery store and go into public and, you know, when you get home and, you know, all of the little parts and pieces of doing normal everyday life in the middle of not just health concerns, but lots of polarity being created around people's beliefs around it and judgment about your, what you decide to do in the middle of it. Um, I've had to do a lot of checking in with my body. Yoga has been super helpful for that. So it doesn't even have to look like yoga. Um, just being mindful of like where I'm holding tension and why and what it feels like and doing a lot of checking in with self. You probably have found the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of that. And I also rely a lot on um, the responses of my body in session. Um, you know, it, it helps guide my clinical work. Mm -hmm. Well said. Yeah. How would you define happiness? It's the small moments where things are just okay. Because um, I think we spend a lot of time making happiness like a goalpost. And once we get here, we'll be happy. And then once we achieve this, we'll be happy. And happiness becomes this like static thing um, that we just need to reach. But if you notice when, when the people around us leave us, whether by passing or by, you know, moving on to other parts of the world, moving on with their lives and for whatever reason, when we think about them, we don't think about those big markers that we had made for when we'll be happy. We think about the small moments, like when we would, you know, make coffee for each other. We think about small little pieces of their personality. We think about that's, I think if we could appreciate all the small moments every day where nothing was wrong and we were content, we'd be a lot happier. I agree with that. Next couple questions are a little vulnerable. Uh, what is the most embarrassing moment you've had as a clinician? Gosh, there's so many, you know. How do you? <laughs> <laughs> so I was thinking about this, and it's not, it's not really that vulnerable. It was embarrassing because I made such a fool of myself uh, when I first moved to Austin. The apartment I had got these weird beetles in it. They were like giant black beetles that weren't like bite you, like poisonous bite you, but they would like chomp at you. And it, it went on for like a month that I was trying to get my apartment complex to, you know, get rid of them. And so I had to like everything that was touching the floor, I had to pick up like blankets that were touching the floor, comforters, or else they would climb and then they would get onto things. And I thought, had that pretty well covered, got dressed, went to work one day, 
um, on the way to work, I felt something on my leg and I pulled over and I jumped out of the car and I had a, what must have looked like, like an exorcism on the side of the road. <laughs> and I didn't feel it anymore. And I knew it had to be one of those things. And I, I couldn't find where it went, but it wasn't in my car. I checked and I didn't feel it anymore. Couldn't, couldn't identify that it was still on my person. I went to work. Two hours later, after I've been in two process groups and treatment team, <laughs> I'm walking to lunch and a bug just falls out the hem of my pants in front of, <laughs> I don't know how many people, a giant black beetle just falls out the hem of my pants. And I was like, well, that bug had a lot of therapy today. <laughs> had been to a lot of therapy today was how I handled that and I just kept walking uh, but it was very like everyone around me was like did I just fall out of your pants and I was like yep <laughs> he's just been tagging along for group and everything he knows lots of things by now he should have uh, as far as like just humor is embarrassing that's the most embarrassing thing yeah. yeah okay next one is do you currently see a therapist or have you in the past uh, currently, I don't, but I have uh, various times, um, you know, moving here um, during and after a divorce, just prior to becoming pregnant. Like, when I don't know what I'm doing, I should ask somebody else. Yeah, no, there's that, that logic, you know. Yeah, I'm kind of shocked by the number of therapists who've never been to therapy, fully licensed therapists who've never been to therapy. I don't trust um, them. I think it's super, super, super helpful. And nothing has to be really wrong. Um, it's just a good place to go sort out our stuff so we can make sure our stuff doesn't get mixed up with our client's stuff. Because that can happen right. super easily before even the best of us have realized what's happening. Well, I mean, not just that, but to know what it's like on the other side, on the other couch, you know. Oh, oh yeah, it really, in, in some, in, well, not always, but sometimes in a little bit more, it's even scarier because these are, it's a much smaller sampling of the population. You're much more likely to see this person again in other settings. You're much more likely to have to, you know what I mean? Like be telling someone something and then find out they know a bunch of people that you know, mm -hmm. which has happened to me. <laughs> um so it's, you know, am, I'm, am I telling something to someone that I'm going to have to interact with professionally later at some point and be pretty mm -hmm. scary? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. Which is weird that it would be so, like, shamey. Yeah. You know, even as therapists. Mm-hmm. And that, to me, is a damn shame. Isn't it? Isn't it? I mean, it just shows you that just because we have the knowledge doesn't mean our behavior looks like a person that has that knowledge and understanding. Because we know better than anybody how well it works mm -hmm. and why it's necessary. But knowledge was all it took. We wouldn't have any doctors or nurses that smoke. Yep. Well, Jen, is there anything else you think would be good for a potential client or other therapist to know about you? I just can't think of anything. Um, you know, I, I do a lot of work based around Brene Brown's curriculums. I'm certified in her work. I'm a certified Daring Way facilitator, which is her, you know, grouping of curriculums that are based on her books. And I only bring that up because she does a lot of talking about really similar and parallel ideas and themes of what we've covered in this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and people are very familiar with her now. And so being able to attach it like, oh, this person also talks about some of these same things. And to know that there's actual therapeutic work that can be done. If you've read some of her books and they speak to you, that you can do some more personal work related to that stuff, perfectionism and such. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
All right. Well, what's your website? It is hiatuswellness.com. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Jen. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to Next Quest Podcast. I learned something new today, and I hope you did too. Stay tuned for our episode next week featuring Julia Stammen to discuss her practice and areas of specialty, neurodiversity, geek culture, and relational trauma. Next Quest Podcast is sponsored by Jan Dimmitt Resources. Save yourself the time and stress of credentialing and let the experts at Jan Dimmitt Resources do what they do best. For over 20 years, Jan Dimmitt Resources has provided administrative support and credentialing services to mental health professionals in Texas and beyond. Visit their website at jandimmitt.com. That is J-A-N-D-I-M-M-I-T-T dot com or call 512-731-5725 for more information on all the ways they can make running your practice easier for you. Next Quest Podcasts relies solely on donations to keep this project going. Please consider becoming a patron on my Patreon page at www.patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Next Quest Podcast, or you can make a one-time donation on my website at www.nextquestcounseling.com slash about Next Quest Podcast. You can also support the podcast by liking our Facebook page. Until next question, this is Noah Garcia signing off.